Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria. Let's talk very briefly about pole arms. So, um, in the last few weeks, I've done a few videos on, on pole arms, different types of pole arms. Um, partly because I personally, I've always been interested in pole arms, um, but I've got more interested in pole arms recently for various reasons. Um, partly because they're awesome, partly because it's something I've always been meaning to look a little bit more into certain types of pole arm. Partly also because I'm commissioning um, at least a couple of replicas of specific types of pole arm. And partly also because I'm doing a kind of unofficial secret, uh, bit of a living history um, kind of experiment and that will involve pole arms. Um, now what pole arms am I talking about? Well principally pole axes, bills and halberds are the main ones but also with uh, peripheral interest in partisans and glaives and a few other things as well. Um, this incidentally is a uh, not a very good uh, quality but it's a Hamway uh, winged spear. I would like to get a better one at some point from a decent company. Um, and uh, before I go on, so this is essentially to illuminate you and give you some more information about something and uh, correcting myself in a previous video as well. But just before I go on, some of you have noticed that behind me there is a new addition. I actually have a pair of these, but yes indeed, I do have um, a Roman pilum, okay, uh, or pil pila, pili in plural, um, and this is from uh, Fabrica Cacti. And um, it's, it's a great thing. Um, I will be doing more videos about this. It is very, as always, whenever you get a new weapon in your hands and it's really something which goes above and beyond just reading about things or just seeing pictures of things, even, even studying the statistics of original archaeological examples, which is important. But when you actually get something in your hands, if you're familiar with weapons, um, then it gives you some new ideas and some new insights into that weapon. And I have to say, the pilum, assuming that this is a relatively, and I believe it is, um, fairly accurate reconstruction by Fabrica Cacti, um, has really sort of given me some new ideas about the pilum. Uh, and as I say, I will be doing some videos on these, both, uh, both as a thrown weapon and as a hand weapon. And that's the main thing, is that I'd never really considered it this that much as a hand weapon. Everyone talks about the scutum, and I've got a scutum, let's grab one. Everyone talks about the um, scutum and gladiator but they don't talk that much about the uh, scutum and um, and um, pilum. I'm knocking things over left, right and centre here. Um, and you know, you normally people talk about this as, a, as just purely as a throne thing and then pull the gladius out. But I think there's a little more to it than that. In fact, I think there's a lot more to it than that. And I think in hand-to-hand -hand combat, this is a fairly considerable uh, weapon by itself. Um, firstly, from the front end, but also, importantly, just make sure I don't knock anything else over, from the back end as well, because you've got a butt spike on there. Anyway, as I say, I will talk more about the, um, the Pelum uh, in future, but just to really illustrate the fact that I'm trying to expand my experience with pole arms. I've got some experience obviously over the years, particularly with spear and bayonet, my main things, but a little bit of pole axe as well. Um, and quarter staff as well, actually. Um, but uh, trying to increase my experience of um, pole arms, but also my historical knowledge um, and sort of data um, uh, that I can draw upon when I'm talking about pole arms. And that's where this book comes into play. So, when I recently made a one of the videos I made about pole arms, I made a statement about the fact that there are woefully inadequate sources on pole arms and there are very few people really studying pole arms. There's actually quite a lot of people in HEMA studying the use of pole arms, but there's relatively few people studying the pole arms themselves. And ironically, there's actually quite a lot of pole arms out there to study. Archaeologically found ones and ones in arsenals and museums. Um, certainly from the 16th century uh, onwards, there are a lot of 16th century pole arms in museums and collections. Just go to the Wallace Collection or uh, the Stibbert Collection or wherever. Um, there's a lot of 16th century stuff. And there's a surprising amount of 15th century stuff as well. As you go earlier, we obviously get fewer and fewer. But in my video, I said that there are basically no video, no um, books on the study of pole arms, except for one Italian book, um, which I can't remember the name of right now, but I think that's out of print anyway. And uh, several people, and I have to thank you, I can't thank you all individually, because I think there were about 12 people individually contacted me in regards to this book. And um, so I went and procured a copy. Now, I have to warn you, unfortunately, I have to break your bad news, 
Number one, I believe this is out of print. Number two, it's expensive. Um, this cost me, I got this for about 80 something pounds. So that, I mean, it's, it's, it's a fair size book. And I have to say for academic books, that's not ludicrous. There are some books out there of this size that are like 300 pounds. But I understand for any normal person, 80 pounds is a lot of money for a book about pole arms. Um, I'm in the very enviable position that, you know, it's uh, for research purposes, uh, it's something that I can justify um, buying. Um, but um, uh, this is unfortunately expensive. Now, the author is John Waldman. Obviously, I'll put a link to this book below so you can find that here now. It is called Hafted Weapons in Medieval um, uh, in medieval Renaissance Europe. It's not medieval and Renaissance Europe, but anyway, there we go. Um, and uh, it's a great book. It's not perfect. It's not exactly the book I was hoping for, but in some regards, it's better than I hoped for. So, first of all, it's very clear that John uh, Waldman, or Waldman, don't know how it's pronounced, this is published by Brill Books, incidentally, who I think are in the Netherlands. So there's a, I'll just show you a little bit inside, there's some early, early halberds, first kind of halberds that appear pretty much in the 14th century. There's stuff about the construction, uh, how they were actually made. Uh, there's some later 15th and 16th century halberds there, um, and it goes on different types of um, different types of pole arm over quite a broad period. Actually, it goes up to about 17th century. Um, some partisans and such like that. So uh, it's got lovely pictures. It's got. Uh, make really good data on it, you know, measurements and statistics state taken straight from uh, museum examples. Um, but where it falls down, in my view, is it is called Hafted Weapons in Medieval Renaissance Europe. Medieval and Renaissance Europe, I think. Oh, it does say Medieval and Renaissance on the side, but not there. How strange. Anyway, uh, Hafted Weapons in Medieval and Renaissance Europe. Um, and where it falls down, in my view, is it neglects some really, really important um, weapons. Uh, not totally neglects, but um, I'll explain a bit more. So first of all, it's very clear that the author is really, really into halberds. Okay, so halberds get an amazing treatment. If you're into halberds, this is a great book and I recommend getting it. However, there are certain other pole arms, uh, it claims to be about half weapons, but there are certain other pole arms that either get minimal attention or almost no attention. Okay, examples. So it does state at the beginning that it, there's not really going to be any attention given to spears and pikes. So that's fair enough. The author has said that straight up at the front. I would still say, as a criticism, that's a shame uh, because, of course, spears and pikes are an enormously uh, numerous and important type of pole weapon, probably the most important pole weapon that mankind ever invented. And in the medieval and renaissance period, spears and pikes were still very, very important. So it's a shame, but you know, the author does say, fair enough, you're gonna uh, skip over those because for whatever reasons. However, there are other weapons which are dealt with in here, and I don't believe that they're really dealt with at all in enough depth. The primary ones being bills. Bills are incredibly important. They are dealt with in here, but I don't believe in anything like the depth that they should have been, uh, because in some countries, England and Italy, for example, bills were more important than halberds, um, and halberds have a huge section, and bills have a small section in here. Um, and uh, second, secondly, pole axes. Now, pole axes are incredibly important. Now you could say, okay, a pole axe is a knightly weapon rather than a common soldier's weapon. Not totally true as a statement, but maybe as a generalization. Um, so maybe this book is looking more at the massed units kind of weapons. You know, you've got big groups of people with halberds, big groups of people with bills, um, perhaps even glaives and partisans. You don't have big group, groups of people with pole axes, admittedly. However, it does deal with pole axes, but in a very, very cursory way. So what I would say is, you know, in the land of the blind, the one I'm man is king. So in a world where we have very few books or, you know, decent books on pole arms, this is a must buy. OK, so if you're interested in medieval and renaissance pole arms, get this book. However, I have to warn you, it has got some fantastic stuff in it, particularly about halberds and construction of, of um, how halberds are put together and certain other weapons as well and also statistics and nice photos from museums and stuff like this. Great, however, if you're really into pole axes or you're really into bills, you're gonna be disappointed, unfortunately, okay? But for halberds, 
absolutely amazing. Anyway, there we go. Um, I'll finish up there just to say really, I want to look more at pole arms on this channel, both uh, the pole arms themselves and how they're constructed and the different terminologies and stuff like that. Also how they're used. Uh, we'll be doing a little bit more of that with a bit of demonstration with one of my training buddies, probably Pedro or someone else. Um, and also I'm going to be looking at Roman at the, at the Pelum, definitely, because I've got two of them now, so I can do some various things with those. Um, and I do recommend this book if you have about £100 to spare on a book about pole arms and you're really into pole arms. However, just to warn you of those um, sort of downfalls of the book, it's a great shame it's not still in print. If it was still in print, I'm sure it would only be about maybe 40 or 50 pounds. Um, but there we go. And it's a real crying shame um, that books of this nature have such a small readership that they usually don't go into a second edition. So there are several books that over the years were a bit expensive and so I passed them over and thought, oh, I'll buy them later. They went out of print and they're now ludicrously expensive. Or in one case, I looked recently, I literally couldn't find one to buy anywhere. So sometimes if there's a rare book, if there's a fringe interest book you want to get and you can afford it, buy it because they usually don't make a second edition. I would also say in regards to uh, Dr. Tobias Capwell's book on English armour, if you want a copy of the first volume, buy it. Um, because it's possible that that won't have a second edition. He's got a second volume coming out, and when the second volume comes out on second half of the 15th century English armour, buy it, definitely. But if you haven't bought the first volume yet, buy it, because when the copies run out, uh, that might be it. You might not get another chance to get one. Anyway, there we go. Uh, cheers for watching. I will be talking more about Paul Arms soon, and see you again on Scholar Gladiatorial Channel. Give me a subscribe and a like, and I'll appreciate it a lot. And if you're the first person to comment underneath, obviously, you know, everyone likes to comment first and then I'll congratulate you. See you soon, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.